This is um, things I wish I'd known earlier when I started playing developer. Also, alternative titles could have been casinos will hit, hit you when you learn these simple tricks to improve your developer life. Or maybe, I followed these simple developer hacks and you won't believe what happened next. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm Gary. Um, yeah, I came back. They had me back from last year's keynote, so thank you very much for that. I'm pretty excited to be here. I love playing computer games. Oh, hello. I love playing computer games. Um, I have a podcast to talk about computer games. I really enjoy playing computer games, and if you were at my keynote last year, you'll know that I, I like to talk about games. Unfortunately, I'm really, really bad at playing computer games. For somebody who loves to play them so much, I'm terrible at actually playing the games. So, like, I, I've got really bad hand-eye coordination. I'm not quick enough on the, on the controller or on the mouse and keyboard. I'm not very good at it. So I tend to spend a lot of my time Googling for phrases like this <laughs> to try and get a little help and understanding to improve my game playing ability. So this is a pretty common thing if you play computer games. If you don't play a lot of computer games, um, this could be a long talk for you, sorry. <laughs> but I'll try and sort of keep it to a minimum. Um, but I tend to do a lot of Googling for things like this, things I wish I knew earlier when I was playing and the game. This is particularly useful in sort of role-playing games or games where there's lots of hidden content, so you can go and find that cool hidden content. And the reason I think this is kind of important is because if you're playing Pac-Man and you've, you're from a generation like I am, where you, you, know, you remember playing this as a kid, it's pretty obvious what you have to do, right? You have to eat the little dots and stop the ghosts from, from killing you. But if you've never played this before and if you come to the game from fresh, it's not actually that obvious what you have to do. Things are only obvious when you actually know them. So things that may be obvious to me are not obvious to somebody else. And it's kind of important, you know? Oh, look, I didn't even realize that when I eat this, this little white dot, now I can go and eat the ghosts. You know, when you, when you know it, it's obvious. But when you don't, it's difficult. And I think it's important for me to think that this is definitely something that I feel like in my career, there's so many things that I'd wished I'd started doing or wished I'd known earlier in my development career. So we're going to just cover a few of those today. I'm not shaking at all. Yeah, I am. Mm. And so the first thing I think, these are in no particular order of importance. They're just how they randomly came out of my consciousness. So the first thing I think is really important is to put some points into charisma. So again, with the, the tedious gaming analogies, um, when you create a character in a game like this, anyone know? We, we'll have some shouting out games again today, I think. Anyone know what this game is? Follow for, right? It's a classic. So I, I typically never, ever put any points in charisma when I'm creating a character. I'm like, oh, I don't care about that. You know, I want to be strong or, or accurate or lucky. I don't really care about the charisma. And when I say in your career to put some points into charisma, what I'm not talking about is um, things like be, being more of an extrovert and talking to people. And, you know, that's not what I mean at all. You know, it's difficult for people to, to just sort of start conversations. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to try and make your interactions with other developers in your, in your daily job more friendly and more thoughtful. I guess that's what I'm saying here. So we've all had conversations, you know, maybe we're trying to, to think about how we're going to solve this new problem in, in, in our job and somebody makes an idea and you're like, in your mind, you're like, that's a really bad idea. You know, that's, it's not a great idea. You know, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard is what you're thinking and it's how you kind of push that along, how you make that statement to your colleagues and, you, you, you know, your friends and your, your bosses and, and the people you're working with is the most important thing. And it took, me, it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out that if I just said, oh, that's a bad idea, you know, it, it didn't really go down well with my, with my colleagues. Whereas if I phrase it another way, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly sure about that idea, but have you considered this idea? Your, much more receptive to your, your, your colleagues. Again, this may sound really, really obvious, but it took me a long time. This is like a bit unnerving, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, it took me a long time to figure that out, right? Come back with another idea that you think improves upon the idea that's given, rather than um, just saying, you know, oh, that's a, that's, a, nah, that's, a, that's a terrible idea. Sometimes we have to say no, though. You know, sometimes we really do have to say to our, to even to our superiors in, in the office environment or in our, our careers, sometimes saying no is the right thing to do. 
And it's important to, to realize that saying no is definitely something that you need to learn to do. This is really flickery and scary, but we still have slides, it's all good. So yeah, just saying no is sometimes what you really, really need to actually say. Um, don't be that person who says horrible things, but then prefaces it with, you know me, I'm a straight talker, I tell it like it is. You know, being a straight talker is no excuse for being a dick. You just have to <laughs> try and be nice in your, in your daily interactions. And, and yes, try and be honest. Yes, try and, and, and be a straight talker because things get solved quicker. But just try and be nice. And sometimes you, you do have to be a bit of a dick to get things done, and that is the contradiction here. You know, sometimes being too nice doesn't really achieve what you want to do. I'm not saying get walked over by people is basically what I mean here. I'm not trying to say, you know, always be nice at the expense of, of, of your career and your perception. So sometimes we don't have to be too nice. But really try and be as nice as you can. Um, this is definitely something I've struggled with in my career. Um, it's kind of done the rounds on Twitter a, a few years ago. Listening to someone is not just waiting for them to finish so you can make your cool point. Um, and I, <laughs> I'll put my hands up and say, you know, I've, I've been there where I'm not really listening to what the, the person's saying anymore. I'm just waiting for them to finish so I can make my really witty comeback remark. And that's not listening. Because you tune out halfway through the sentence. You think in your mind you know where this sentence is going. Therefore, you kind of tune out. Well, really, you don't really know that. Because once you've tuned out, you don't know how that, that sentence is finished. So this is definitely something I've consciously try to work on over the past few years to try and engage in conversation rather than it just be two people talking at each other. Excuse me. So my next tip is to quick save regularly. Um, there's no excuses in this modern day. If you're, if you're as old as me, then you'll, you'll remember like saving the game was a real pain to actually do every time. You have to swap discs and put the other disc in, and I even remember having to save games onto tape, which is a whole different problem. But there's no excuse now. We can quick save in games regularly. We can whack F5, and then when we inevitably you know, overreach and, and end up failing something, we can come back and quick load. And of course, the, the obvious analogy here would be like version control is your, is your quick save. So committing to version control regularly means that you have points where you can get back to if you, your experimentation goes wrong. That's kind of the obvious analogy, but you know, I used to use Dropbox for version control, so I'm not saying to use Dropbox, but use something that you would actually <laughs> probably get. The, the obvious analogy is not what I went for, because I wanted to really shoehorn something about unit testing in here, so I guess I've tediously linked that to quick saving. But for me, like, it, it is almost like a quick save. Having a unit test suite, or a test suite, not necessarily a unit test suite, is something I really, really, really wish I'd learned about much earlier in my development career. Um, it's a big step to take. I, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna sort of judge anybody who's not doing automated testing, but I just really encourage you to, to give it a go because if you've ever had that feeling where you've written a new feature and you've tested it yourself manually, you know, you've, you've gone, you've whacked F5 a million times and filled the forms in and checked everything and the validation's all working, and then you hear that code's gonna get deployed to production and you still have that ill feeling in the pit of your stomach. You're like, I, I'm pretty sure I've tested this really well, but I'm not 100% and it's going to production and oh geez, you know, is everything gonna be all right? That's the time where you need to step into the realms of automated testing, 100%. Um, I'm saying automated testing because I don't think that, you know, unit tests can be a scary place to start. And maybe acceptance testing is a good place to start if you have an existing product, if you have an existing project, and you just want to get some of this um, safety net under you to make sure that every time you deploy to production, you don't have to have that horrible feeling, then maybe a, a browser-based acceptance test suite would be a really nice place for you to start. The, the resources that actually got me over the hump were, were Chris Hatch's books. Um, I am on commission, so use my referral link if, you, if you're going to buy the books. Um, but these are, honestly, I swear, I'm not just, Chris is a friend of mine, but it genuinely got me over the the bump of understanding what automated testing is and why it's useful and why you should be doing it. This is a really nice um, book, The Minimum Viable Tests, because it, 
it really concentrates on the minimum you need to do, which is kind of a really nice place to start. Yeah, so the next tip is uh, definitely play with friends. These games are much more fun if you end up playing, uh, playing with friends. Excuse me, I forgot to ask uh, what game that is, anyone? Half-Life, right? Yeah, the original, cool, sorry. So playing friends is really, really good. Um, anyone know this game? PUBG, yeah, yeah. Let's not talk about that because I am, I'm actually having flashbacks of the horridness of it right now. Um, this is PUBG, it's a, a battle royale game that's kind of really popular at the moment. Playing with friends to me is something that I've definitely, in my career-wise, you know, what I'm talking about here is we're all at this amazing conference. There's a room full of developers here who face the same challenges that you do in your daily job, who, who have the same frustrations and have the same problems. And being able to talk about that stuff with, with peers is absolutely amazing. And the, the people I've met through working in PHP, I count several of them as friends real friends, not sort of conference friends, but proper friends who I'd like to see if I'm not even at a conference. So I really, really think it's important to, 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 to play, to do this job with other people. The other thing that I would mention is um, there's this concept in, in online role playing um, called a twink where high level characters who have been playing the game for a long, long time will help their friends out who are new to the game by sort of giving them items and running them through through dungeons and doing all this stuff to really help them out when they're, they're new to the game. And I think that's a really good analogy as well because certainly there are people in my uh, career who've kind of reached down and helped and pulled me up towards their level. And a ment uh, we're talking about really a mentoring relationship, but I don't think it needs to be a really formal mentoring relationship. There is, if you really do want a, a, a formal mentoring relationship, then PHP mentoring is a really good resource. Um, your mileage may vary. I don't, I'm not confident that having a mentor of somebody uh, random that you've kind of met online with no pre-existing relationship is the best way to do this. I don't think that those tend to work out as well. Some people have had great success with that sort of formula, so again, you know, it's up to you, but I, I think it's harder to find a good mentor on a site like PHP Mentoring or you know, through Twitter or through Slack or IRC or whatever you're using than it is if you have re relationships in the real world. I, I genuinely believe that. It doesn't actually have to be that the, this mentor is this big formal mentor, apprentice, or whatever you use the other side of the mentor, mentee, I don't know. It doesn't need to be this hugely formal relationship. I count several people as my mentors who have, who have helped me through my career, but it's never kind of been this formal, structured thing. There may be somebody in your office, you think, oh, you know, they, they, they do really good work, I wish I could do work like that, and just, just ask them, just say, you know, I, I, I'd really like some, some help, is there any chance that we can, we can have this kind of mentor relationship? It works more often than you'd be, you'd be surprised. Again, just to go back, you don't need this formal mentoring relationship. We're at a conference. You, you're all sat in these amazing round table situation here. Just, just talk to people, make friends within the community, and leverage those friendships to help you to, to get through your, you know, your, your, your job and your career. That's really important. The, the one thing I'll say when talking about friendships, mentorships, is it all revolves around asking questions. And asking questions can be really, really difficult for lots of people, me included. You'd never know it because I ask questions every single day now. I'm almost too lazy where I'll try and solve a problem by asking a question of a friend rather than trying to solve the problem myself. But when I first started out in this community, asking questions was a really, really difficult thing for me to do. Um, you know, it's fine to not know things and it's fine to ask people for help if you don't know things. But there's always this problem where you, you ask somebody for help, particularly, I think, in an in office environment or in a, a work environment, that when you do ask for help, you're worried that you're revealing a weakness in yourself. You're worried that, oh, I'm asking a question here. I'm going to look like I'm an idiot. People are going to know that I don't know these things. And that's a, you know, there's a, it's a recognized imposter syndrome. It's a recognized um, trait, I would suggest. More people in this room have felt that than haven't, so it's completely normal. It's really difficult to get over, but 
asking questions is the way to fast track your career, really. You know, ask questions, make friendships, and try and get some kind of mentor relationship. It'll really, really help you out. I wish I'd done that a lot, a lot sooner, personally. So this is a really quick um, tip. Uh, I haven't just shoehorned in an idea into a convoluted gaming metaphor, honestly. Um, <laughs> but play online. So does anyone know this? We, we had PUBG. Anyone know this game? Fortnite, right? Yeah. So weirdly, I, I just grabbed some screenshots that were free to use off the internet. That's not me in the corner. Um, even though I was kind of surprised. I went, Whoa, I just found a screenshot with myself in it. It is not actually me. <laughs> we haven't got slides, but it's fine. I can waffle on forever without slides, so it's not a problem. What I'm trying to say here when I say play online is it's really challenging to play online because you're playing against other real-life players rather than playing single player. And what I'm trying to say here is it's difficult, but you learn much quicker because you, you put yourself into that difficult situation. So we say drop hot when we play in these games. That means drop into an area where there's loads of people. It's tempting to sort of skirt around the out, out. You know, if you're playing PUBG, it's tempting to land somewhere really quiet so you won't see any of the players early, which is great, but you just waste 20 minutes and then get sniped from across the map without ever seeing anyone. The way to learn really quickly is to put yourself into the difficult situation, to move outside of your comfort zone. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make is jumping in at the deep end. Like, if you're trying to learn a new framework, you absolutely need to understand the basics. But going through a blog tutorial is going to teach you the basics, but not a lot more. Trying to solve your own real-life problems is the way to learn things much quicker, I think. I think you're much better off to, to do the difficult thing early. You'll learn a lot faster. So the next tip is about learning the mechanics, so with my wonderful game and analogy, understanding how the mechanics of a game work allow you to be better at that game quicker. And does anyone know this wonderful game? Anyone? No? Yeah, it's EVE Online. Yeah. Spreadsheets in space. So this is, this is a genuine screenshot of an EVE Online battle. It's, it's a crazy, 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 crazy game. Um, it's the best one I could find to, to illustrate this. When I talk about learning the mechanics, I, I mean I'm really learn, talking about learning, I think that from my personal experience, I really wished I'd learned about design patterns earlier on in my, in my career. So design patterns are just reusable ways of solving common problems in programming. It's, it sounds much more scary than it is. This is the, the typical, the Gang of Four book that is typically held up as to be the kind of, um, the, the, the design pattern Bible, so to speak. But I, I mean, I couldn't really read that, <laughs> I'll be honest. It's a bit too convoluted and a bit too dry for my taste. So I, I mean, design patterns will really, really, really help you out in your daily job. And you don't need to be scared because they have crazily, crazy names that make them sound complicated. They're really simple ideas packaged in a way that for some reason makes them sound really complicated. Dependency injection sounds like this really intimidating thing, but it's a really, really simple concept. And you don't have to know every design pattern right down to the sort of computer science, uh, scientific level. You just need to understand generally what they are and what problems they help you solve. That's all you need. Um, I, I learned about design patterns from uh, Anthony Ferreira's YouTube channel. They're really old, dated videos now but the design patterns haven't changed, so they're still really, really good. I highly recommend, um, you can't put a YouTube link on a slide, so just search you, YouTube for programming with Anthony, and there's a ton of um, YouTube videos that Anthony did that just really easily introduce you into design patterns, really unintimidating, pretty cool. And there's a good LaraCast uh, series on design patterns as well. Um, take those as you find them. They're not, <laughs> they're not, exactly how I would interpret some of the design patterns, but it's a really good resource. At the end of the day, if you're, if you're learning about these tools to help you to solve your, your daily problems, you know, it's all good. However, however they're called, it doesn't matter. The big scary thing for me about design patterns is that once you see and learn the design patterns, I tend to then see these problems everywhere and end up using these design patterns because I know them. I'm like, oh yeah, we'll solve that with a proxy or we'll solve it with you know, this or that. When all you have is a hammer, right, everything looks like a nail. So I do say to, to use them 
as you know, always learn them, always use them. But sometimes, you, you know, you know, you may be being a bit convoluted to solve a problem because you like to use this new shiny thing that you've learned. I definitely did that for a long time. The other thing we talk about really with mechanics is best practices. Most best practices are best for a reason. It's a really opinionated thing, the word best. It's not your best may not be necessarily my best. But I think most of the things that have floated up to be best practices have done so through years and years of people using these practices. And they've come before us. It's like almost like standing on the shoulders of giants. We are, we are working on practices that people before us have decided are best for a reason. Um, definitely use them. If you don't, you know, not everybody actually wants to use the PSR coding style because maybe you, you, know, you don't like your curly braces on the same line in that place. It's, it's easy then if you just say, now we're going to use our own coding style. But when we're all using the same coding style, after you've got used to the new coding style, reading anybody else's code becomes so much easier. There's a reason that we want best practices in the industry. There's a reason we want standards in the industry. So definitely use them um, or don't. I mean, <laughs> it's your project, right? But I would definitely think to use them as much as, as, much as possible. Uh, again, I was definitely guilty early in my career of thinking, oh, I, you know, I could, that, that's not right. That's outdated way of doing things. I could do things better. Yeah, playing other games is like, I get so infuriated at a point where I'm repeatedly failing to do something, switch off and go and play something else. So this is, as a really, really bad gamer, this is probably the worst game I've ever played, for me personally. Does anyone know this game? Cuphead, yeah, right? So it's, oh, it's so hard. It's, it's the hardest game ever. Obviously, what I'm trying to say is to, I, I really feel like, Try, trying out other languages outside of PHP gives you a really, really interesting perspective when you come back to PHP. When, and I, I don't mean sort of learning languages to the same level that you know PHP. I just mean just, you know, dip your toe into a different language. Understand what, what problems could Python solve for me that I'm not, you know, that makes it easier than PHP. What problems could Go or Swift or, or Java or whatever. Just look at what problems other languages can solve. If nothing else, you'll, you'll come back to PHP with a, a renewed sort of appreciation of what it does well. You'll also have a renewed appreciation of what it does badly, but that's for another day. Um, you really will. You come back to PHP and you go, yep, do you know what? This shared nothing architecture actually makes life a hell of a lot easier than uh, you know, uh, the, al the alternative. So definitely, I would really recommend anyone, if you feel like, oh, do you know, I fancy trying out Go for a while, just go out and give it a go. That was a terrible pun that I didn't mean to make. I do apologize. I'm actually, uh, because I really, really like badly typed languages that you can intersp intersperse into HTML, I'm moving into working in backend JavaScript for a while. So I'm really excited to do that, believe it or not. Um, yeah, no types for the win, I think. But I'm really excited to do it because I'd like to know more about what problems that solves and then come back to PHP with an understanding of how we could maybe do things slightly differently. We've got a lot of uh, influence from Java in PHP, uh, for better or for worse. That's something that seems to be getting only more so as time goes on. So maybe learning a bit of Java could be really, really helpful. So here we go, my favorite tip of the day. <laughs> Cheat. If all else fails, cheat. Does anyone know this game? Yes, Counter-Strike with a wall hack. Um, yeah, cheating. I've definitely learned a few sort of tips that I would consider to be cheating over the years. Um, this is not going to be like, you know, anything to do with hacking in and changing your grids or anything, you know, nothing to do with that. This is, for me, when I look at wall hacking, one thing that I really am so glad I learned, I learned this fairly early in my career, was, was empathy. Um, empathy is like a superpower for developers, and I really believe that it's something that can be learned and can be taught and can be practiced and can be trained. 
I, I, I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, you either got it or you haven't. I totally disagree. You can definitely get better at being em uh, at empathy. This book is really, really good. This has nothing to do with um, technology at all. This is just a general book on empathy. It's really, really good. And what empathy does for me is twofold, really. If I'm having some kind of, um, let's say, abrasion at work and a disagreement, um, typically with Marco Pavetti, but <laughs> it, could be, it could be anybody else. If I'm having this disagreement, being able to sort of switch sides and to, to see the problem from somebody else's perspective is just so, so valuable. So empathy is the ability to, to understand how someone else is feeling or how they're thinking. And being able to do that will help you so much in development and in life. Let's be honest, this is a, this is a life thing rather than a development thing, but it's, it's a really powerful tool to have if you're working in, in a development. So if, if your boss is, you know, you really want to do this, rewrite the, the existing code base and do it in the latest sort of framework that's hot today, and the boss is like, oh, no, we, we don't want to do that. And you're like, why won't he do it? Just maybe thinking about what is going through your boss's head rather than just going, oh, he just doesn't want to do it because he's not interested in the new shiny stuff. Maybe there's budget constraints. Maybe there's more projects coming up the line that you don't know about. Being able to think in someone else's shoes is amazing. And the other thing it's really, really good for, I find, is we build, typically, p people in the room will be building websites. And websites will have users. And being able to put yourself in a user's mindset is like, really is like a superpower for me. Being able to think from the logs, nobody's clicking the cancel button. Why is that? And then you look and you think, oh, right, because it's not on the page when my users are actually on a mobile phone. Being able to kind of put yourself into the mindset of what your user's doing is so empowering. It's really, really a uh, useful tip to, to do. This is totally irrelevant, but this book is really good. This is nothing to do with empathy. But because we were talking about users, I just thought I'd put a quick uh, book up here. This is an amazing book. This is about how to, how to, to uh, it's not like, I don't mean design as in the design of a website, but how to design applications so that your users of the application end up becoming advocates for your application. So I used to work at JetBrains and, uh, you know, PHP Storm, we've always been a big believer in this kind of thing where we try and make our users feel so empowered that they go out and sell their product for us to their friends and coworkers and colleagues. It's a really good book for that. Don't worry, we're nearly at the end and then there's beer. So the other, the other cheat I think I've used mercilessly in my career are code reviews. I mean, I've used this, I've, I've used code reviews to level up my, my development skills mercilessly, also known as Marco is watching, if you were here last year. Um, but code reviews, and uh, code reviews with peers in work are great because if you're not doing code reviews, you probably should be, um, unless you work on your own, in which case, I guess, yeah, you're stuck. But code reviews are amazing for getting perspectives of other people and for understanding how other people would solve the same problem that you've just solved and why they would do it differently, more importantly. It's almost like getting somebody else to do the work for you, which is why I think it's cheating. It's like, oh, I'll just make a token go at this problem, and then I'll go, go for code review, and everyone else can tell me how I should have done it. It's like a really cool cheat to have. <laughs> you don't need to, you know, open source, I, I, I preached about open source last year, but open source is a great place to get code reviews to, to level up your development skills. I say it's free learning for me. Code reviews are really, really good cheats. It's teamwork, yeah. It's teamwork, but only if you make a really proper attempt at the problem before you actually put the code review up. It's, otherwise, it's cheating. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask if anyone knows what this game is, but I just realized on the monitor here that it's in the title. So I guess, <laughs> I guess there's not really much point in me asking this. Um, I don't know. This, how obvious is too obvious, but because I tend to spend most of my day asking my peers and friends to do my work for me, I ask a lot of questions. And the process of actually verbalizing a problem means that you have to solidify what the problem is in your mind before you can speak to somebody else and tell them what the problem is. And the number of times I've done that and then said, actually, don't worry, I've just realized what the answer is when I'm actually telling you the problem is unbelievable. So there's this, this concept called rubber ducking where the, the idea is you, you take an inanimate object and you explain the problem 
to an inanimate object, and in the process of doing that, you solidify the problem in your mind, and then the answer will come to you. And it works so many times, it's unbelievable. I say, honestly, the number of times I've said to, to friends, oh, I can't get this to work, and I'm trying to do this, and then, oh, no, I know what the problem is now, thank you, and put the phone down, it's unbelievable. It's a really, really nice trick. So, yay. That's my, that's my list of tips. We're only 30 minutes lot, so that's nice and concise. Concludes my uh, randomly conceived list of tediously linked things to computer games. Um, really, you know, I want to repeat a few points because that's what we do, right, at the end of talks. So I was trying to, what I was trying to do here, I, I don't know if I'm trying to like, come up with a catchphrase for myself or anything, but let's, let's give it a go. Be nice. Be nice, you know? It's, it's just a general thing. Make friends. We talked about how important that is. And have fun. Thank you very much.